Hey guys, um, we're out here in the trailer again because that's where most of the gear is and the rope is and everything else. And I was doing some inventory while building a new fixture to pull test Sutra harnesses. Um, I can't get a hold of and can't import a one of the crash test dummies they use to test harnesses. They're enormously expensive. So I'm building one out of steel and foam wrapping it all so that I can fit a harness to it tightly to be able to pull everything and pull test the various points on the harnesses um, just in layman's terms. I mean, it's not like a fall factor. It's not dropping a test dummy. There's all sorts of problems inherent with those kind of tests and ways to standardize them. I, since I have the 12 ton pull tester, I know what the points are rated at. I'm going to basically fill out the harness. So I'm going to have legs where the legs go to attach to, and it'll fill out the torso length. So when it's being pulled it's not just a loose piece of material it's in tension around the fixture so anyway i got tired of doing that i came out here um thought i'd do a little wrap on rope today we're going to do performer flying rope or line um so i'm going to separate this because there's working lines um which may be the static line you use to guide stuff off while you're working and the perms the lines you use etc there's also the lines we use, which are double braids. They're a jacketed either Dyneema or Technora product, Dyneema or Technora product, um, that are zero stretch that we use in our base stations. So for clutches, for gold tails, for things like that, high abrasion situations, gripping situations, you're going to need a between an 8 and a 12 millimeter or an 8 and a 14, depends on your device's um, rope to work with. Um, and the tendency has been towards those double braids being very low stretch. We're not using stable braid anymore, which flexes and stretches. We're not using other ropes that have 5% stretch. We're going down to ropes now that have literally 0.5% stretch at 500 kilos, 0.5% stretch at a thousand kilos. Um, they lend themselves to pinpoint accuracy with everything. Um, Today, I'm going to talk about what we fly people with in the reds, off the cranes, just performer flying lines in particular, um, which narrows it down. We'll get into the other ropes at another point. Um, I'm going to go into a bit of history. Um, flying performers has been around forever, back in Shakespeare's day, even before that, back in the Greek days. Um, ropes were used to levitate people, levitate things. Um, you know, riggers slash there were sailors that began the industry. Um, in Shakespeare's time, you used ropes to do things, fly people. Um, fast forward in the last gazillion years, since like the turn of the 19th century, um, in the 19, early 1900s, they were using piano wire. And there's some great call outs on strength of piano wire. There's some arcane knowledge to know about piano wire, the strengths of piano wire. And the reason they did this, of course, is they didn't have visual effects to be able to pull out the lines and stuff. So they tried to make them as non-visible as possible. So on theater was the basis before they had movie cameras of doing all this and, you know, visually seeing lines in the air from a distance in the audience was always a problem. So they went with strong and light and there were some specific ties for these kind of piano wires, butterfly ties, etc. It's all very arcane. Um, they would blue the wire so it was so black you couldn't see it. Um, you know, these were some cool skills. Fast forward there into the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. We were using 7x19 aircraft cable, um, which is still a standard today for Circus, Cirque du Soleil, a variety of performances around the world. Um, you're using uh, aircraft cable, 7x19, non-rotational wire. You can get wire. It's another whole deep study on wire. Right hand lay, lang lay non-rotational, you can get a million kinds of wire, you know, improved plow steel. There's, there's a lot of things you can deal with. Um, so originally in the movies, we were flying people with aircraft cable. 7x19 is a particular size uh, or the particular call out on it. It's very flexible, but not so flexible as what we use today. Um, it had some Good points and bad points. The good points being you could terminate it. You'd carry a kit around that looked like this. You'd have a Nyko press. You'd have sleeves of varying sizes. Um, typically the wires were eighth inch and five, uh, three sixteenths inch if you were in the US or three mil, three and a half mil and uh, five mil, common sizes. And you'd have these sleeves. You would form it around a thimble. 
and you have a thimble to put into your uh, your wire, you'd form it around the thimble. You would then put the sleeve on, compress it all, and you'd have a termination, an eye termination, which was holding 90 plus percent of the strength of the cable. Um, disadvantages were you had to carry around cutters or crimpers, cutters. And this is when I came in the industry, we were still using these kind of things. <coughs> um, very effective and still very effective. You have go, no go gauges. You have your, your correct tool for the job, for your sizing. You have, uh, you know, you can do this quite well. Um, you tape these up because there's always a little tail that sticks out. These are hard, of course. So you tape them up so you don't get stung with them. Um, spend a lot of time bleeding off these things. Um, and the wire is flexible, but it's not very soft. It's metal wire. Um, the additional problem with these is that the D to D ratio, which we commonly refer to as the diameter of the wire versus the diameter of the shiv, for wire needs to be like 20 to 1. That's just, I mean, there's other call outs, but generally speaking, it's at least 20 to 1 for any form of longevity because the way the wire is made, as it bends over a shiv, the inside is in compression, the outside is stretching, so it's unequal, and it <clears throat> over cycling will break the wire. So the smaller radius is not acceptable. Um, all those things meant that your shivs in theaters, etc., were huge, you know, for a, a five mil. Um, piece of wire, you needed a, a 200 millimeter shiv, you know, or a 100 millimeter shiv, excuse me, a 100 millimeter shiv. Um, so, you know, you're looking at a, a minimum four inch reel diameter with the groove in it. Um, plus, wire needs to be supported. The shivs for wire, if you look at the way wire is dealt with, it needs to have the full two thirds of the wire belly supported in the correct um, curve. So the shivs are very specific to sizes of wire, um, all for longevity. And, um, you know, the thing is, is for stunts, it's not as important. You're not doing five shows a day, seven days a week, and, uh, you know, the wire is being used continually. Um, so what evolved in our industry um, was wire replacement, because wires... Um, as technology improved where cable and wire was used for long runs, the longer a run, of course, the more weight of cable you have. And think of it with big stuff when you're pulling large objects. If you've got one inch cable over 500 meters, that's a lot of weight. So you can subtract that from the load that you can actually use that cable for. The same thing with performers, um, the weight of wire over long runs. If you're running 50, 80 meters around in the ceiling on a stage, that's a weight of wire. Um, when it's not in tension, it hangs. You get a lot of belly, so you have to run more shivs. Um, it's also a lot of weight the performer feels when they're moving around. It's dragging this stuff around. So it had its drawbacks. Well, synthetic came along, which was used in the wire pulling industry, i.e. underwater cable pulling, um, radio tower stuff from line pulling from tower to tower, in that it's extremely light per length with the same strength and a few more positives to it. Um, so in the film industry, we adapted this, uh, this flexible and synthetic rope medium as a cable replacement. Now these were made from, <laughs> for want of better anything is calling, their aramid fibers are basically plastic. You have a variety of these available to you. You have the uh, high weight molecular polyesters, which are Dyneema, and it's various similar trademarked counterparts. You have the, the um, Spectras and Aramids. You have Technora. You have uh, liquid crystal polymers. There's several kinds. One of which is very useful is, um, is Vec Vectran. And I've used Vectran. I like it. Um, so these are all the different trade names. Every rope company, whether you're in the U.S. or in Europe, comes up with a different flavor of a similar stuff. In sailing, um, the, high weight, the high molecular weight polyester um, stuff is used a lot. It's known as Dyneema. It's used for rigging. It's extremely strong. It floats. It does not absorb water. It has very good potential for us. 
The main problem with Dyneema is that it is not heat tolerable. So it runs between uh, around 140 degrees centigrade um, is a max for it before it loses its, its ability to hold. And even at 100 degrees, which is boiling water temperature, if you were to put Dyneema in that and pull test it, it's lost a huge, more than half of its strength. So Dyneema doesn't tolerate heat. Um, other fibers like Aramids, Spectra, and uh, there's, there's several kinds. They're good, but they can be brittle. So cycling in rope over pulleys and over use, um, they break. Um, now, when I speak cycling, we have to understand rope companies look at cycling different. Um, they'll they'll run it over shivs thousands of times in a repetitious machine to test how many cycles they can get. Um, in stunts, we don't really do it that much. So some of this becomes knowledge and some of it becomes something we can just do away with. I mean, um, but the aramids like the spectra and uh, and other harder fibers tend to, they're, they tend to be brittle. Um, Technora is a fiber um, made by Taijin. It's a fiber company in Japan. Um, it is a, it is the best compromise currently for what we do. It is a 12 strand hollow braid product, which all of these are. It's the kind of a Chinese finger trap. Let me put this away. Don't need a Nyko kit with me right at the moment. Um, that was designed as a cable replacement. Um, it has very good strength properties. It's extremely lightweight. It's extremely soft. It's extremely flexible. Um, we bring some here. So this is some six millimeter Technora product. Um, as you see, when I say it's a hollow braid in that it's like a Chinese finger trap. So you can see the center core is hollow. It is braided. It is 12 strands, hence the name 12 strand hollow braid. This is Technora. It's a very soft fabric. Um, and it's about three and a half tons for six millimeter in minimum breaking strength. Um, that's on quarter inch. Now true six millimeter is about a thousand pounds less. So you're at about three tons uh, or thereabouts. And the reason I say this is depending on where you're at and where the manufacturer is, like I said, every rope manufacturer has a different kind. So Marlowe makes a true six millimeter product. This is in particular Samson. It is a quarter inch product, an imperial product, which means it's 6.4 millimeter. So just that 0.4 millimeter picks up another thousand pounds or 500, 450 kilos um, strength. So you have to be aware of what you're, you have to always look at what you're using um, when you're calculating things. Um, so Technora has great use. It's what the primary rope we use, whether it's six millimeter or quarter inch or larger. You know, we have eight millimeter here. Um, and there's uses, depends on when and where you want to use it. But typically we use six millimeter. In the beginnings of the synthetic rope, people were designing things with the old standards of eighth inch and three sixteenths wire, which is what we use to fly people. So you had five millimeter was common, but the fact is five, the difference between five and six millimeter visually is insignificant. So six mil became a more or less a standard um, and you buy yourself, um, you know, quite a bit more load. And if you just look at the charts, you'll see it. Um, disadvantage of this rope is it does absorb water. So this is when rope selection for flying performers gets to be important. If you're in and out of the water, if, wa if rope has to tension through water and it's dropping in the water in between, you might want to use a Dyneema product. It floats and it absorbs zero water, whereas Technora will get heavy, it will become a sponge, it will sink, it will spit water when it tensions up in a little fine spray everywhere. So visually, that's probably not something you'd want to see on film. Um, the plus on Technora is it's good to 600 degrees, um, which for stage and in our, in our business with the lighting, since you're running in the ceiling, you're running above the perms, above the stages, all the heat's up there, all the lights are up there, and you're getting things, I mean, on some shows they've used racks of lights that are so hot you can't touch things in the proximity to them, you can cook food up there. Um, this doesn't care. I can hold a blowtorch on Technora and it won't matter which means for fire gags, etc., 
you can take the least um, protection by just dampening it with some fire gel and you can do pulls and drops with people on fire and have no real problem with this. Um, the an added advantage of these 12 strands like this is in use, you don't need a fit, you don't need anything except a fid kit to terminate it, which is, a, you guys will all know what it is, but they're fids. They're both a tool and a unit of measure. Um, when I say a tool, because we use these to splice eyes in the 12 strand uh, per manufacturer's instructions. And they're also a unit of measure in that the splice will be called out by the length of the fid for that product and how many fids create a termination. Now, a short splice in Tech 12 is three fids. A long splice is six fids. Um, obviously, with six fid splice, you get a better result, better taper. It takes a moments longer, um, and sometimes that irritates people because they always try to see how fast they can do this, but it really doesn't matter. Um, so you need fids and a knife, and you can make all the eye terminations you want. You can use various thimbles in your terminations, which we've already done pull tests and shown what thimbles buy you. Um, here's the forged ones that are recommended for this product. So you, you fid this into your eye, and you have a perfect eye that can pull. It doesn't abrade the rope. It also gives you more stability in your shackle. Um, they're a very good thing to have. A lot of times stunt guys don't want to say, I don't want to land on it, but you already have a back pad on or you have pads on. You have a lot of things going on and landing on that in an odd shape is a very slim chance. Um, you know, if it's that critical, you can always go without as we've proven, but it does have effects on your shackles, this particular on the six mil shackles. Without a thimble, you will tend to bow the pin far before you will without a, a thimble. Um, but this is the predominant rope in stunts now because of its friendliness. It's soft. When it's, when it's under tension, of course, it's as tight as wire. And it will give you rope burn or hickeys or whatever you want to call it when it rubs you. But it's not steel wire, which was far worse. Um, an added advantage if and when, say there's big things going on, and you've seen this with the effects guys, um, and this does break, it doesn't contain any, it doesn't hold any kinetic energy. So the force of the breakage just evaporates, and poof, and you end up with plastic in the air as opposed to a cable breakage, which snakes across the ground at a high velocity and tends to injure people and kill them, depending on the size of the cable and the weight of the object. Um, a good example of this is log drags in the logging industry. Uh, when cables snap on that, people get chopped in half. Um, and that's big cable because it holds the energy. It's got mass to it. So with that much mass under force, it becomes quite deadly. Whereas this doesn't. Um, the advantage also of this Technora product is on long runs on stages, it has very little weight. So the performer isn't pulling this so much. This is not a heavy, even if it's slack, there's no weight behind it. You can notice the difference when you play with your performers. Take this and then run some 12 millimeter Kern mantle. Um, you can see it um, in a gymnastics and or performance way when you rehearse with a lunge, lunge lines. Um, you know, two from a hip pick over some pulleys on both sides when performers are trying new tricks and you're following along and trying to take the bite out of bad landings and things like that. Carrying that, that six, that eight, 10, 12 millimeter Kern mantle with you is a big difference in weight compared to this. Um, so it has serious advantages for what we do in the film and it has become the new standard. Uh, a couple things it has, if you look when you purchase it, like Samson has a whole page on inspecting this line and it will get fuzzy over time in use because they're very fine individual strands woven into each strand that's woven into 12 strands. Um, they have a call out on how fuzzy it can be. They have a call out on how many of these little strands can be broken. And you need to familiarize yourself with all that because just because it's fuzzy and just because it may have a broken strand doesn't mean it's critical. You're still gonna have 95% of your, your load limits and you shouldn't be working anywhere close to that anyway. Um, where, where you have to worry about a 5% loss is what I'm implying. So um, pay attention to the product you use. 
Uh, Technora is the best compromise product. And like I said, there's another one I really like. And these days, I'll digress a bit. Um, Technora has gotten quite expensive since COVID times. And uh, Vectran is a very viable option for this. They're both low creep, um, super low stretch. Um, and Vectran is only a few pennies more now, and it is more available. It's a liquid crystal polymer. It's quite effective, quite strong, quite nice to work with. Um, but it also is very heat resistant. So you have to look at what you're doing and decide. Rope is not always perfect in every, it's like anything else, your selection of your pulleys, etc. Speaking of which, because of this is so flexible, the D to D ratio on Technora product is very forgiving. It's only three to one. So three times the rope diameter should be your minimum shiv diameter. So this is six mil. So an 18 is minimum, which is very small. Um, most pulleys, which enables you to use maybe smaller pulleys, something like some guy, a lot of guys use these. Um, and because it's so flexible, a lot of times you don't have to worry so much about supporting the rope, which will not need a dedicated six mil shiv. It will flatten out over a wider pulley and it doesn't lose much longevity or strength as wire would flattening over a pulley. You have to understand this gets into your shiv selection for the rope you're using. And again, ideally this is supported as in cable in a shiv that's the correct diameter that will support the rope over two thirds of its base and keep it round, which is ideal. But um, it can tolerate far different uses and one of them is it can flatten out over the shiv and so you don't need such specialized shivs which opens up your shiv choice considerably when you're choosing what you're going to use and of course you get into ropes like bob which is specifically used for wrapping around drums on winches and guys use it on their 3d winches and things which is braided specifically to be bent over shivs or around drums um, it originally came out of the boating industry. Um, it's called Bob, B-O-B, -B, and it's basically bent over a radius type stuff. And um, it's, it's great for that application. The only problem is it is a Dyneema type rope, so it's very low temperature resistance. So you have to consider that. Um, again, it's a compromise. You have to look at what you're doing and where you're doing it. Um, and Technora fits most of those as an ideal product. Um, each manufacturer will have a different feel to it. Each manufacturer will have a different coating on it. Um, so you can choose what you get and what you use it for. Um, UV light is not its friend. Um, again, dirt is another thing you don't want grained into this rope because it will be abrasive over thousands of cycles. Now, if it's a, a week's worth of working in the desert, you know, you can decide what you want to do. You can keep it as clean as you possibly can, but it's not going to hurt it that badly for the number of cycles. Now, a year of that, it will significantly reduce it. You'll see how fuzzy it gets because um, it's abrading back and forth. And as it abrades, this will get lighter colored in the UV and fuzzier and fuzzier and fuzzier. So, you know, it's very forgiving in that respect. And with a strength of three and a half tons, um, it helps you knowing that it's far and above. I mean, it's stronger than generally most of the shivs we're using. It's stronger than most of the anchor points we're using. Um, it's not gonna be a point of failure on this. And one last caveat, and I will mention it, um, when using these types of ropes, they have zero stretch. I mean, at 10%, I mean, at 10% of strength, so three and a half tons is 3,500, kilos, so 350 kilos, which is a fair amount of force on this, it stretches 0.6%, which is virtually nothing, okay? At at 20%, which is 700 kilos, it's 0.9%. So what this does is it transmits all of your force when you pull, when you fly, so the performer feels every last bit, but the negative is Negative acceleration, i.e. the drop or fall factor, increases dramatically. So you have to allow for that um, in your D-cells because they'll feel it. It's a sudden stop. It's like hitting concrete. Um, there is no stretch to this rope. It's not like 
using a dynamic rope where you're a lead climber and you take a big whipper and it's big, soft, and stretchy. That doesn't happen with this. This is a big slam and a dead stop, hard. And that increases your fall factors. It increases the numbers that everything sees when you do that. Um, so when you think you're operating within limits and you have a sudden e-stop situation or a sudden dead stop situation, the math goes up very quickly um, in terms of the forces to your performer, as well as the forces to the harness, the forces to everything in line. It transmits all of that force because it uh, has zero forgiveness to it. Something to always keep in mind when using this type of line. Um, it is not, there is no stretch and no forgiveness to it. So you have to remember that, um, especially when you're planning or calculating all of your system, you have to look at, um, you know, the old standard was 10 to one static to strength on everything. So if it's a hundred kilos, it was a thousand kilos, um, which is a really old fashioned, pretty not, not functional way of doing it since nothing is static hung that we do. Um, you know, the ANSI 143 um, goes through, and I, I think everyone should look at it, the ANSI 143, if you don't use it already, it's an American thing. Um, it tells you the strengths of things you should have, and it measures it in multiples of the dynamic movements of expected force and of e-stop situations. And, uh, you know, you aim for three to five, you know, uh, design factor. Um, three times an emergency e-stop situation, five times a, a major working load. So as an example, you have a serious goal tail drop um, from 10, 10 meters, 15 meters, and you're doing a superhero slowdown in the last meter and a half or eight feet. Um, and that D-cell being what it is, um, it's going to transmit all that force so you have to calculate that 100 kilo person is going to see at least five times, sometimes eight times body weight. Okay, so you're seeing five to 800 kilos. Well, at, at a design factor of three, that's 2,400 kilos load. And that's still within the three and a half tons on this line. At a design of five, 800 kilos is 4,000. Okay, so you're just over the limit on this. Um, so you have to understand where you're at and what you're using. The numbers go up in a hurry and most people just go, oh, it's good enough. Um, you know, you have to calculate this kind of stuff. Uh, and understand that this rope may not break at that point. These are minimums, you know, three and a half ton is a minimum on this rope. Um, it will go longer and more. We've seen that. But also look at the forces you're generating on your performer. So you have to do the math. And this rope really helps give you some breathing room and it and lets you design rigs that will be quite functional, not heavy, cover long, long distances with light weight and uh, be very precise in everything. So this is the standard is Technora for a variety of reasons. It's a good compromise. And like I said, you have to decide what the use is to try to use some of the others, whether you use a liquid crystal polymer Vectran or you go to a, a high weight, uh, high molecular weight um, polyethylene, like a Dyneema product because of the water. But in general, most of your uses will work with Technora. And that's the primary rope because of ease of splicing, performer friendliness. It's relatively soft. It, uh, you know, it lasts a long time. It can cycle. I mean, I was looking at cycles on Bob rope. I mean, when, when they cycle rope, they're talking 7,000, 10,000, 15, 20,000 cycles over shivs. Um, we will never see that in, in our profession. Um, but for permanent shows, they see that all the time. So you have to look at your product and what you're doing. And Technora, it's always not that easy to say, use this one product, but it ticks more boxes than others. So every, everything's a, a flow chart. It's like, here's the boxes I need ticked. What comes closest? Technora usually will satisfy that. And that's why we use it. So that's the predominant rope in the performer flying industry currently. Um, and that's what we use in the films. All right, thanks a lot, guys.